I'm going to give a brief presentation about ecofeminism in India. I'm going to look at certain episodes from our colonial history and re-evaluate them from the ecofeminist lens. We are very aware that nature plays a very central part in our Indian ethics and history. Right from the times of Harappa and Manjagaro, we can see the evidences of the nature worship that was going on through the Vashupati seals or the evidences of mother goddess figurine right up till, let's say, the Chipko movement, which was perhaps one of the most visible manifestations of the respect that we have for nature. So we come to the question of what is ecofeminism? So it is a fairly recent development in feminism and this term itself was coined as recently as 1974 by Francois de Dubon. She postulated that oppression of women and other marginalized groups is intrinsically linked to the degradation of the natural world. And both of these oppressions arise as a result of patriarchal domination. Globally, ecofeminism gained traction only in the 1970s, where a number of studies revealed that several ecological issues, such as global warming, food crisis, nuclear disarmament, nuclear contamination, are having a disproportionately larger impact on women and other marginalized groups. So closer home in the 1970s, we had the Shipko movement. However, there are a number of other movements, particularly in our colonial past, which can also be categorized as eco-feminist movement. And I am going to start with the Salt Satyagraha. So Salt Satyagraha was initiated by Mahatma Gandhi and in opposition to an op oppressive law that was the Salt Act of 1822. As per this act, the British had the monopoly over the salt production and the taxation of the salt. Now, selection of salt as an object through which civil disobedience could be carried out had a threefold purpose. The first was that it uh, outrightly showed the uh, moral aspect or the immoral aspect that a uh, resource as naturally abundant as salt is going to be monopolized or taxed by the Britishers. Secondly, it served as a unifying agent because any household, regardless of caste, religion, is going to have requirement for salt. And thirdly, which is perhaps the most important aspect of choosing salt, is that it also involved women. How? In the words of Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, women naturally preside over the culinary operations. Therefore, salt is for them the most intimate and indispensable ingredient. So due to gender roles, matters of kitchen are usually considered the preserve of women and the salt, a very essential ingredient of Indian kitchen provided an effective entry point to women in the then politics of colonial struggle. See, the availability and cost of salt was of very direct concern for the Indian women because they were tasked with the job of running a cost effective kitchen. Here connections with ecofeminism may be drawn Ecofeminism postulates, as we have discussed earlier, that women tend to bear a larger proportion of the burden of ecological degradation or the dis indiscriminate consumption of natural resources as compared to other groups. Ecofeminism aims to resist the extractive and arbitrary attitudes and policies concerning natural resources, as they tend to have tangible and higher costs for women. Thus, the salt satyagraha can be said to be premised in a way on ecofeminist thought, where women began to assert control over the decision making concerning natural resources, salt in this case, and they resisted laws they considered unfair, exploitative, extractive, and indiscriminate. In the earlier parts of our colonial struggle, that is before the civil disobedience movement, women played a role, but it was secondary. And the primary role was concerned with their. Uh, services to the family or looking after the family. But after Dandi, Dandi March, women began to view themselves as having agencies and as the equal partners in the colonial movement. So there are largely two common criticisms that are leveled against the ecofeminist ideas. First is that it essentializes gender roles. Secondly, it excludes men from the ecofeminist project of Yes, so essentialized gender roles. 
So women's participation initially in the Dandi March was seen as a continuation of the essentialized nature of the Indian women, that is self-sacrificing and devoted to the family. The only difference being that this time the nation was equated to the family. So nation was defined as a larger family. Eventually, after getting this access into politics, women could transcend these essentialized roles and contributed in more militant and alternative capacities as demonstrated by the very valiant contributions of Sumati Moraji, Matangani Hazara, Usha Mehta, Bina Das, Sohasini Ganguly, etc. The second criticism is the omission of men or exclusion of men uh, from these, uh, this particular worldview. So eco-masculinity is one such idea that needs to be explored because it's a field that runs complementary to eco-feminism and it has a perspective that seeks to enable men to assume roles that would challenge exploitative thoughts, patterns and processes. Here a discussion of hegemonic and non-hegemonic masculinities is in order. Hegemonic masculinities tend to denote characteristics like tendencies to exploit, to dominate, whereas non-hegemonic masculinities include traits like capacity to care for the environment. To explain this better, let's consider the case of, or the confrontation of the Pahariya tribe, which occupied the Rajman Hills, with the Britishers who were seeking to commercialize agriculture and bring in the idea of private ownership of land. So here the Pahariyas were subsisting through natural resources, through forests, and they had an immense respect for nature. Something They considered it something that cannot be owned. So they had huge capacity to care for the environment and for nature. Whereas the Britishers are projected as the denoting hegemonic masculinities, which can be um, denoted through identities or characteristics like white, imperialistic, capitalist, enterprising, and eco-masculinities of the Pahadiyas can be seen as denote, being denoted by brown, barbaric, uncivilized, natural, emotional, irrational, and a confrontation between them ensues. So this demonstrates that our colonial history is replete with a rich tradition of eco-feminist thought along with eco-masculinist thought. So Perhaps it is a good ground to explore the potential of ecofeminism in terms of it providing an effective access point to women and other marginalized groups access into politics. Thank you very much.